very much. I wanted to thank um, the staff at Humanities Texas for having me here today. It's a pleasure to be here. I really enjoy doing workshops with teachers. I think you guys do the grunt work um, that sort of prepare us for the college students that we receive later on. So I just wanted to thank Eric and uh, Michael Collette, and as well as Rachel and Liz for having me come here today. Um, I decided to structure my remarks a little bit differently. Um, because I wanted to talk about Frederick Douglass's works, and we'll look at his works this afternoon. But I really wanted to introduce you to him, the father, the husband, the grandfather. I wanted to talk a little bit about his personal life, to give you guys some context for whenever you present him to your students in class, you can fill in and make him more of a person, more accessible as opposed to this distant sort of political figure. So I wanted to talk a little bit, some of it might be repetitive if you know these um, facts about his life, but I also just wanted to sort of introduce you to him, the man, the father, the husband, the grandfather, and talk a little bit about um, his family life, and then we'll talk specifically about some of the major transitions in his life, some of his major speeches, and we'll look at some of those this afternoon, some of you may not have seen before, but I hope that you'll be able to use in your classrooms in a very um, original and unique way. Um, now, after a decade, uh, a decade after his escape from slavery, Frederick Douglass sent a letter to his former owner, which we will look at this afternoon. And in this document, he, la he lamented that slavery was, quote, a condition that he dreaded more than death. Providing more detail, he recalled the chain, the gag, the bloody whip, the death-like gloom overshadowing the broken spirit of the fettered bondman, the appalling liability of his being torn away from wife, and, and children and being sold like a beast in the market, um, excuse me, in the market, um, was one of the things that he thinks about when he talks about slavery. His recollections were very, very powerful. And one of the things that he became famous for, as you all know, is speaking publicly about slavery and about the institution of slavery and talking about it firsthand because he had experienced slavery himself. So that's what's very unique about his anti-slavery rhetoric. And now within these recollections, Douglas maintained a, to a tone devoid of anger or revenge. Instead, he wanted to reflect on his years of enslavement on the 10-year anniversary of his freedom and thought it was most appropriate to direct his reflections to his former slaveholder. The rather lengthy letter, which, as I mentioned, I included in the packet, serves as a brief overview of his life with reflections and, in some areas, an indictment of his, of his former enslaver. The letter closes as follows. I am your fellow man, not your slave. That's a very powerful line that uh, people refer to when they talk about him. Now today, as I mentioned, I'd like to talk about Frederick Douglass's life and his writings from his enslavement and well into his years of freedom. I will begin with a brief overview of his family life and then shift to his writing and rhetoric through an exploration of some important passages from a diverse body of his work. These passages reflect major turning points for Douglas, the witnessing of the brutal whipping of his Aunt Hester, which some of you probably have read about, um, the physical altercation with Kobe, um, the person he was hired out to, um, the gift of literacy and how he responds to first learning how to read and write, and finally, um, his reaction to achieving freedom in the North. Now, I have a brief timeline here to sort of condense with also in the upper, probably up your upper right hand corner, a picture of his first wife, Anna Murray Douglas. This was his first wife, they were married for 44 years. Um, and this just sort of goes over a little bit about his early life and try to give you a snapshot. So Frederick Douglas was born, Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey, in either 1817 or 1818. Now as you know, from, um, some of you may know, most enslaved people don't always know their exact birth dates. Some plantation records record that, um, and some others don't. So you, it just varies. So oftentimes they'll say, I was born around the time of some kind of weather-related event, like a hurricane. Um, I was born around the time of a political event. They might talk about the war. Um, so there's all these other interesting references. And you should, if you're using narratives in your classes, you know, look at how enslaved people talk about their origins. How do they describe their families? How do they introduce themselves? How do they name themselves? When do they rename themselves? How often do their names change? You know, so think about how they set themselves up as human beings. And I think it's important when you look at how we know Frederick Douglass has several names, you know, more than three. And we talk about how we can learn a little bit later about how he changed his names and why he chose the name Douglas. Um, so I mentioned that he was born in 1874, 1818 in, in Talbot County, Maryland. And that's along the Eastern Shore. 
He was the offspring of a white man who he believed was his enslaver, Aaron Anthony. Um, there's also speculation that it might have been one of the Auld brothers. Um, but we're not certain. Uh, and if you look closely at his writings in the three different autobiographies that he writes, um, sometimes he's, one of them he just decides not to talk about it, like my father was my enslaver, my father was a white man, that's it. There's other times where he speculates who his father was. So you have to look, you can look at the different narratives to see how he talks about his parental um, origins. Um, and every, his mother was named Harriet Bailey and she was an enslaved woman. Douglas had at least three older siblings, um, and he had two younger sisters that we know about, Kitty and Ariana. Um, and during his 77 years of life, he was very remarkable in that he was, as I mentioned, born a slave, he learned to read and write, he escaped slavery, then went on to become a public speaker, an editor of newspapers, a recruiter for the Union Army, and the president of the Freedom Savings Bank, a minister, a minister and consul general to Haiti. So when you think about that, I, I almost want to like pause for a minute and think about all of what he accomplished in his life. And it's really something you can do with your students to have them think about all these life transitions from being enslaved to then dealing with beatings and, and, and witnessing whippings and being physically beaten and watching relatives being beaten, being separated from his relatives, and then learning how to read and write, escaping from slavery, and becoming active in politics. Like his, one of his first, first anti-slavery speeches in 1841 was sort of impromptu. They asked, they said, there's a slave in the audience, can you please come up? And he came forward and he spoke for like two hours, just sort of off the top of his head. So it wasn't like it was something that he planned out and had these beautiful words written up until some of the later speeches that we'll see, where he actually spent numerous hours, days sometimes, preparing for his speeches. Um, his first public speech was more of an impromptu sort of discussion or reflection on his life, okay? So just, I mean, have your students think about all of these transitions that he makes, you know, and, and reflect on him as a man and as a human being. One of the things that I always do um, with my own research and in class is to try to make the enslaved a little more human because it's easy for us to put them in a box as an enslaved person and you kind of have some distance to them, you know, we separate ourselves from who they were, um, we, there's, you know, we separate ourselves for a number of reasons. Sometimes we separate ourselves because we may not be happy about that part of the American past. Sometimes we might feel angry or guilty or ashamed about it. So it's often easy for us to separate and put this distance. But when we personalize it and we get closer in to the enslaved people, um, I talk to the students about thinking about um, the five senses and how can we understand slavery through the five senses? You know, how can we, how can we see slavery? And I try to bring in pictures of enslaved individuals, actual photographs of former enslaved people, and look at their eyes. What are their, what are their facial expressions telling us? How can we learn about their experience from looking at them? We can look at their writings, you know, so we can, we can read about their experiences. We can also hear their experiences because we have evidence of their narratives that were recorded in the 1930s that are now audio tapes which you all can access online, you can access it in your classrooms and you can play them so your students can hear the voice of the enslaved telling their stories from their own voice. And it's very, very powerful. I've had students say, you know, it's different when we read about their narratives and you, know, you have us read their text, but when we actually hear them and we hear them speaking and they can, they can listen to tone, they can listen to inflections in their voice. Things that, you know, when you look at the written text, you, text, you don't always see that, right? So it's, it's really interesting to be able to hear the, of the sound of slavery or hear slavery. You, you, I'm sure you, some of you may have done that in listening to slave spirituals or slave songs. And Frederick Douglass has a long commentary on, on slave spirituals and songs, uh, which we can talk about as well a little bit later. But just try to think about ways to personalize this experience and, and allow your students to, to draw themselves closer into understanding um, the period of enslavement. Uh, one of the things that he talks about um, in his three writings is that he, these are narratives that he wrote himself. And when you look at some slave narratives that were published in the 1840s, 1850s, and 1860s, separate from the WPA, the Workers' Progress Administration narratives that were based on interviews from the 1930s, um, the, the texts that were written during slavery or immediately following were often first-hand accounts. Sometimes they had um, a white author help them with the narrative. They had authentic, uh, authenticating documents also included with these narratives. But it's also a lot of scholars debate, and we can talk about this this afternoon, you know, whether or not to use the WPA or use these published narratives from during the, uh, closer to the slavery period. And one of, the, one of the issues is that 
the, the recollections from the 1930s, that most of those individuals that are being interviewed were very, very young during slavery. They were children, okay? Um, and so their stories that they're telling about slavery are either stories that were passed down to them from their parents or their grandparents, or it's their memories. And so people sort of question the historical memory and you know what, what in that gets distorted. So when we look at these writings from the former, former enslaved people who wrote just after being free, or just after having made it through an escape experience, the amount of detail, the level of detail, and the way they talk about it is, is a little bit different than when you look at the narratives from the 1930s, okay? So that's, that's one thing you could do as a comparative exercise in class, is look at the WPA narratives, which are easily accessible online, and compare those to some of the written narratives that were published in the 1840s, 1850s, and 1860s, okay? Um, now going back to the, um, the timeline here, um, this is just sort of a brief overview. Uh, I want you to see the movement, how he leaves Maryland and moves into the city, so he now experiences sort of urban forms of, of enslavement. He's hired out, and being hired out is, is another form of which I refer to as secondary slavery, where they're sort of rented out to another owner. Um, some enslaved people were rented out and they actually received a portion of their wages you know, from the, the person they were renting to or rent, being rented by. Others were hired out and, not, and never ever saw a penny from the work that they did. Their owners would, would send them out to somebody and they would pay them for a year or a month of service. Um, most of the contracts were a year, but we have found evidence that some enslaved people worked for as short as a weekend particularly enslaved female cooks that went to prepare for large weddings. They might have, brought cook, might have brought cooks over from another plantation to then go cook with them and help them prepare for a large event. Um, but for the most part, the hiring that Frederick Douglass talks about and that he experienced um, was considered um, self-hire or hired out where he receives part of his wages. And he talks about that in one of his speeches about how you know, you didn't give me a dime from the work that I did. And he talks about that. So I just wanted to clarify the hiring because some of you may or may, or may not have heard of that. Um, so he works in an urban community. Urban slavery is much different than rural slavery. Um, in much different contexts, the experience is different. You also have enslaved people interacting with people from all over. You're in a, in a community where there's a port, it's a port city. So there's people from different parts of the world coming in and out of this area. So there's a lot of experiences that he's gathering and gaining when he's in this area. Um, he also then gets hired out to work as a person that's considered a slave breaker, which was Kobe, and that's the altercation that we'll talk about shortly. Um, but in 1838, he escapes. He escapes from slavery. And um, he also, that same year, marries his wife, Anna Murray, Anna Murray Douglas, in freedom together. She was a free black woman, um, and she was a, a domestic servant that worked in the homes of people's, um, people's homes. Um, in 1845, he pu published his first autobiography, and then he goes on a sort of traveling circuit after that and starts lecturing about abolition, trying to encourage people um, in different parts of Europe to support the anti-slavery cause in America. In 1847, he establishes the North Star from Rochester, New York, so he now moves for the North. And as we talked a little bit earlier, as you heard um, from some of the other speakers, um, we do know that Frederick Douglass had a few interactions with John Brown, several conversations, two physical meetings, and he decided not to go to the raid on Harper's Ferry. And as Professor Carton said, thank goodness, because he probably would not have la lived after that event. Um, at any rate, so there's an interaction there. I I'm always surprised like when, I, um, when I'm preparing for class or preparing for different talks, to see how many of these major figures interact with one another. I, we cannot understate that. He interacted with Harriet Tubman. I mean, a lot of these people met in, these, in houses and in basements, and I think we think about these historical figures very separately, but oftentimes they interacted together and they were planning and, and supporting this anti-slavery movement. So that's something to think about that I always, um, I always like to bring up when I do lectures. And then I go on here on the slide and show that he also serves as a recruiter for black um, black soldiers or black troops to fight in the Union Army, and two of his sons actually fought in the um, Massachusetts 54th Regiment, which was the film Glory, was sort of designed after. So if you wanted to show a film clip from that to give students visual, you can talk about Frederick Douglass's sons having participated in that. Um, and then he serves, as I mentioned, the president of the bank and then the consul general to Haiti. Um, he died in February of 1895 in um, Washington, D.C. Now, I also wanted to then shift gears and talk a little bit more specifically about his genealogy so that you could actually have a visual portrait of how, he's, how large his family was. I mean, look at the number of grandchildren he had when you see that. Um, 
And I think people don't think about him as, as a grandfather, or they don't reflect on that, mu that much. So as we study his, um, his political accomplishments, it's important to see and understand him in this personal or private role. Um, he, he talks about when he married Anna Murray Douglas in 1838, that she, he, she was his helpmate, which is a biblical phrase. Um, and he talks about how he did not, he did not think marriage was going, she was going to be that helpful. But one of the things that scholars have found is that we don't know much about their personal relationship. We do know that he courted her, but he was very, very private about that aspect of his life, about his, his relationship with his wife. Um, from letters from his children, we know that um, Anna Murray was a little bit disturbed that he was traveling and gone so much and having to raise um, five children. And so we do have some evidence of that looking at their daughter's letters and, and some of the letters to and from his children. Um, but the two of them bore five children. And as you see on the far right, Annie Douglas, um, she only lived to shy of her 11th birthday. And one of the things that we learned in this story was that it was a very, very difficult time because he was away when his daughter died. And he felt a little responsible for that. He talked about grief. Um, and, he, and they talked, like his daughter, he wrote a letter to his daughter and he was talking about how he was pained that he wasn't there for her passing and he felt upset. His wife had a very, very difficult time with losing their last child. Um, so this is a little personal side of him that we really don't hear about when we talk about him as a politi the, um, politician. Um, at any rate, um, we also know that he wanted the best for his children. Just like you have parent-teacher conferences with your students', your students parents, he went to schools, he advocated for his, his children, he fought for some of the discrimination they experienced, and he went and spoke with teachers, he went and put pressure on principals to make sure that his children were educated properly. So that's just another aspect of how he operated as a father to his children and trying to educate them. Um, in 1860 though, that was the year that um, his daughter died. We do know that that was a difficult time as I mentioned. And um, at this point, you know, they had been married for a long time, but he had been absent a lot, and that made it difficult for Anna. Now, these are some images of his children and his last wife, um, Helen Pitts. He married Helen Pitts two years after his first wife died. She was white, and he was very surprised at the controversy and the response and the reaction that he received from marrying a white woman. Um, I think he was disappointed because he had experienced so many positive interracial interactions in the anti-slavery societies that he was a member of and was shocked that even in that moment in 1884, people had a very, very significant problem with him marrying a white woman. Um, but she was his secretary and she had worked for him for another year, a number of years. And they said that after his first wife died um, in, um, in 1882, he was, he, was, he was sort of depressed. And some writers describe it as he was sort of in a frenzied state for a while. Um, and that he was not, he was sort of locked up in his home and he really couldn't function for a while. He was very much free, but, but we don't really know much about how he got through it. The next thing we know, he's two years later, he marries um, Helen Pitts, who was someone he knew for a very long time. She was very close to the family and knew the family very well. Um, the, these images here are his other four children. His oldest child was his daughter, um, who was pictured on the, on the bottom right. And um, also, as I mentioned, the, the picture of his wife. I wanted to show just another um, portrait of his grandchildren because I wanted to go down another generation. Um, his grandson Joseph was someone he was very proud of. He was a uh, he played classic violin, and um, Douglas was very proud of that. There's evidence that he went to some of his concerts and he talked about that. And this is um, this is Joseph's family here, pictured in the center, and also Frederick Douglass the third, third in the middle picture. This is him as a child, and this is him later meeting um, Booker T. Washington. All right? So just a little bit about the family life. Now, shifting from his family, I wanted to talk and spend the remainder of my time um, discussing some of his writings through an examination of four key moments in his life. Um, but first, let's just talk briefly about his role as a publisher and an editor. Now, I have here on this slide the different um, autobiographies that he wrote. And I haven't done this in a while, but it would be interesting to look at, at a number of them back and forth. Like, look at how he describes certain scenes. Like, in certain, in certain narratives, for instance, when he talks about the beating of Aunt Hester, in one, it's just a, pe it's a paragraph, and another, it's three pages. So, you know, looking at the time period, why that changes, you could compare maybe how he introduces certain stories that happen or when he talks about things. Compare them based on these different narratives. 
and see how and what, what does the language change? Why does it change? Is there more emotion in one than the other? Does he have other illusions in there that he includes or that, does he leave them out and why? Um, so that's something that I think would be another interesting exercise that you could do in your classes. Um, now, when you also think about him, Frederick Douglass was also a publisher. So now he's a former slave, he becomes literate. He um, is a public speaker, right? He's doing all these talks, but he also decides to publish his own newspaper, the North Star, in, de in December of 1847. And some scholars talk about his work as a publisher, and they say it did more for the, quote, freedom and elevation of his race than all of his platform experiences. So they're saying that this published newspaper that he had, and some of the writings, not just his own writings, but other people's writings that were in there, had much, a much larger impact than the public speech, speeches that he gave at these anti-slavery societies. Now that, that could be debatable, right? But I think it's interesting to think about you know, what is in the North Star? Get a copy of it, bring it to class, have the students look at different columns. You know, what kinds of articles are in there? What kinds of stories are in there? What, who, what other writers are there? Are there other writers that they recognize, that you all recognize, that you could study? Um, I think that would be another um, good intervention to do in the classroom. Now also, as some of you know, Frederick Douglass was also a suffragist. He also very much believed in women's rights. Um, and here, I just have a few uh, images here on the left. is an image of his wife, Helen. And there's uh, his signature on this, um, this document about women's suffrage. Um, but one of the things that I, that I always think about and that I want to share is that when he advocated for women's rights, he worked hand in hand with people like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. So you could bring in some of their writings and contrast that, or even their writings at the same time to see how their work either overlaps uh, is the tone of what they're saying similar? Are they, are they borrowing certain phrases? Are they using the same phrases? Um, so these are famous writers, and we have a lot of their speeches and access to them, so that would be a great exercise that I think you can do. Now, he um, attended, Frederick Douglass attended the first women's rights convention held in 1848 in Seneca Falls. And he believed that in equal rights for women, as he once wrote in the North Star, quote, all that distinguishes man as intelligent and an accountable being is equally true of a woman, unquote. Thus, in 1866, along with Stan and Anthony, he founded the American Equal Rights Association, an organization that demanded universal suffrage. So he was, as you know, fighting for the cause of African American freedom, but also for the right for women to vote, okay? And so I think that looking at that, that aspect of his life is also um, powerful in and of itself if you're gonna do a unit on, on women's history you could include Douglas in that as well. Um, so now one of the biggest speeches that I'm sure a lot of you have heard about or read, and I'll, I'll read some of this in a minute, um, was the speech on the 4th of July. Um, I, he, this speech was interesting because he was asked to give the speech and he did not want to give it on the 4th of July because he was rejecting the holiday because he didn't, he didn't feel like it was something that African Americans should celebrate. So he said that he'll deliver this speech for the Rochester, New York um, Ladies Anti-Slavery Society, but he'll do it on the 5th of July. And um, he used a lot of metaphors in here, and this is pretty much hailed as one of the greatest anti-slavery um, speeches ever given. So I would, I would take a look at this. Um, I have just an excerpt here. It's, it's a very long speech, but he talks about what is the meaning of the 4th of July to the, to the American slave. So it's asking you to think about it from his perspective. You're celebrating independence, but this really is independence for, for my people, as he's saying. You know, he talks about all of the different hypocrisies, and it's kind of a forceful speech. He talks about the mockery of your prayers and sermons. And, um, and, and your thanksgiving and your religious parade and solemnity are, to him, more bombast, fraud depiction of impiety and hypocrisy. So he's really forceful in sort of calling out the hypocrisy of celebrating independence. And we talk about, I mean, some of you may have read um, Edmund Morgan's piece about the American paradox. You might have read about that in your class, and about the American paradox, about how we're founded on these principles of independence and freedom, but at the same time, liberty and freedom, at the same time you're enslaving a whole group of people. And so that hypocrisy is this, the, great American, um, the great American paradox. 
Um, so Douglas sort of throws this in the face of his audience. And I, when I, I remember when I first read about this when I was a graduate student, I remember thinking, what did, you know, were they ready for that? Like, how did they respond? Like, were they upset? Was it, was it offensive to them? And actually it wasn't. When he finished his speech, everybody stood up and they gave him a standing ovation. So they received it. We have to think the audience that he's speaking to is okay with that. They're happy with that. They're, they're an audience that's supporting that because it's an anti-slavery audience. You know, somewhere else, delivered somewhere else, you might have had some problems, right? So something to think about is when you think about the audience of intent. Um, I also here have um, the scene here from the beginning of his Aunt Hester, and as I mentioned, to encourage you guys to look at how this changes in the way he describes it in some of his other writings. It's a very, very graphic scene where his owner, um, Aaron Anthony, is beating his Aunt Hester, and um, it represents, I would argue, one of the turning points, one of the great turning points in his early life. Um, because it, he talks about how he can't get this memory out of his head, you know, and that he even hid himself in a closet for, for a little while until the, till the, um, the bloody scene ended. He says, that, he says that he had to move away until the bloody transaction was over. Um, and it was just a chilling scene. Now, I didn't put the real graphic ones. I know you guys are eating lunch after this. Um, so I didn't put the one where he actually physically describes, you know, I'll leave it at that. But he physically describes, you know, the blood and, and how she's tied and how her back looks and so forth. I didn't want to put that up there. I used to remember the first time I did that in class, students were like, can we not do this before lunchtime? <laughs> so I'm being a little more sensitive to that. Um, but one of the reasons why Aunt Hester was beaten was because she was going to visit a man that she loved named Ned Roberts. And her owner was upset because when he went looking for her, she was not in her cabin. And so this just, to me, shows relationships you know, the risks people took, enslaved people took to see one another, and it shows that she was willing to suffer severely from this, from this particular meeting. Um, the next one is the, the, another seminal moment in his life was the scene with Kobe, which was the person that he was hired out to. Um, he talks about this as a turning point in his career as a slave. I think that language is very interesting. Turning point in his career as a slave, because that career ends and then he becomes a politician. He becomes a, you know, um, a publisher and all these things. So he also says about this scene later, and I don't have this part of the quote in here, is that you now see a slave become a man. So it's almost like a rebirth of himself after this particular meeting. And he also talks about how he was never beat after this particular scene. This was his last major, major meeting. Um, very, very powerful scene. Uh, we can talk about this a little more this afternoon. Um, then he talks here about learning how to read. And um, he says, the more, the second quote, the more I read, the more I was led to abhor and detest my enslavers. I could regard them in no other light than a band of successful robbers who had left their homes and gone to Africa and stolen us from our homes and in a strange land reduced us to slavery. So, you know, he's starting to read a lot of material. Um, he's learning about different movements of anti-slavery. He's learning that there are people that support his cause. And this is also sort of encouraging him to then speak publicly and write about slavery. I would ha be happy to talk about the first quote this afternoon. Uh, particularly the use of the N-word. Um, we can talk about that in our small groups and how to deal with that when you come to texts on slavery that have the use of the N-word. Um, I always am cautious when I teach it because in public speeches, whenever I'm, if I'm reading a quote or something and I say the N-word, I feel like I lose the audience because they're, they're, they sort of stop on that. And so I think that's something we should absolutely talk about because you will see slave narratives that use that word and it's something that we need to address. I mean, it's part of a public controversy and everything. Um, Jig with the Huckleberry Finn and the rewriting of that, so we can talk about that. Um, just the last couple slides I wanted to show here um, are his thoughts when he first, when he became free on reaching freedom, um, the wretchedness of slavery and the blessedness of freedom were perpetually before me. This is the moment he became free. This is how he interprets this experience. It was life and death with me at the same time, right? But I remain firm, and according to my resolution, on the third day of September, 1838, I left my chains and succeeded in reaching New York without the slightest interruption of any kind. How I did so, what means I adopted, in what direction I traveled, and by which mode of, of conveyance, I must leave unexplained for reasons mentioned before. He's a fugitive slave, and fugitive slaves can be sold back into slavery. So I'll close here with a picture of his house in Washington, D.C. that I encourage you to tour if you ever go there. Um, you can go in and see this large, um, estate-looking house that faces over the Anacostia River. 
And um, I look forward to talking more about some of his other works and other speeches and even letters this afternoon.